Uh, welcome to the Maisha Kazini channel where we have conversations with the different people who are thinking and reflecting on different aspects of life. So today we are so honored to have Mkawasi Mcharo Hall, who is a playwright, a teacher and an artist. She grew up in Kenya and is now living in the United States, but her work still uh, affects us here and she has been a very powerful voice in considering different issues to do with the arts and even with identity and, and the politics of home. So welcome, Kawasi. Thank you, Wandia. Thank you. It's been so long since we saw each other. We just see each other on Facebook. Yes. I think last time last time we saw each other face to face was 2015. Oh yeah, when you were, was it when you were doing the play? Yes, when I was doing the play. How, how maybe you can tell Kenyans about right. that play, the performance? Okay. Let me be brief about it. So with that 2015 I came home to do Puma. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a play that was exploring trauma, and uh, and I wanted to look at what an ordinary Kenyan does with what they go through, that they never talk about. How do you how do you carry on with life, knowing the wounds that you're carrying internally, and mm -hmm. how do those wounds sometimes manifest in, in your body? And, 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 and mine. So basically the story is about a, a young girl who has this big dream. Her big dream is coming true. She's a soloist in, in a choir. And remember, we used to have these mass choirs just before, for these big uh, sherehes. So she's mm -hmm. a soloist, big dream for her. She's going to sing. And on her way to sing, she suffers an asthmatic attack. And another man coming along the way, also carrying his own traumas, uh, you know, they, they meet and uh, all the people along the street try to d figure out what to do with this. So it's really Kenyans who are trying to figure out what to do with this child who has suffered trauma, who has a dream uh, to go do this big thing on Jamhuri Day. Um, mm. that, that's, that's it. Okay. <laughs> that's and, the story. And, yeah, and, and it was at uh, National Theatre, I remember. National Theatre, right, right. Oh, right. It, was, it was quite an experience. Yeah. Uh, creatively, it was an awesome experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned a, a lot about the, the business of showbiz in Kenya. Uh, that one, I had taken for granted. Uh, two, it seemed to me that some things were just so simple to get. It should be so easy to get, yet we couldn't. Not that, not that we couldn't, we did not want to. Uh, so it's a kind of experience that could have been explosive in as far as getting uh, the audiences, the listeners to come. It's a fireside that should have had a lot of people coming to hear their story. Uh, but the business of showbiz in Kenya is also a business of trauma. It's, it's a business of rejection. It, it, it's a business of I don't want to do this. And I, that's not my story. I don't want to hear that. I want to laugh. So it, it's so complex, all that came into play. So I became an audience of watching the trauma of showbiz. <laughs> so Ken so ended up doing the play for you. As well. <laughs> That's what it was. Let, let's go into that a bit. I, I know we hadn't planned it, but uh, you're not the first artist I know right. who has said that being an artist in Kenya is trauma. Um, and in fact, that artist also packed packed his bags and left. Yeah. He couldn't handle it anymore. So maybe we could talk about that a little more because right. we are both people in the arts. Right. It, it's something that isn't said much. Mm -hmm. So right. what were the things, what were the obstacles you ran into and what were the lessons? Okay. So the, the arena I came to in Kenya was very different from the arena I left. Uh, 20 years back because by the time I was leaving 20 years back it was easy for me to put up a play and have and fill up houses at the Kenya National Theatre. Uh, when I came back a lot had happened already. Kenyan ha Kenyans had kind of moved into a space of, of craving laughter to heal themselves 
and that is what I saw was was uh, really playing out and was succeeding phenomenally. Um, uh, yeah, cheap cheap laughter. Scripts that that people would take British scripts or or, or European scripts that you would go and collect from the, the library, and Macmillan Library or any other library, and you make it into a say a Kikuyu play or something, and you you fashion it into the the humor that was uh, people could laugh. So that that played out very well. Uh, but if you brought in a serious play, it was very difficult to 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 sell it, um, to put it to an audience, and people would be like, oh wow. And, and, and to even get that done, I realized three months wasn't going to cut it. I, I had to invest two, three years there. I had to decide I'm going to leave this place and, and set up camp in Kenya and live there for two, three years in order to get the kind of storytelling I needed on the ground. So one, just selling the idea of, of, of watching a play for an entire month Monday through Monday was near impossible to plant in three months. Uh, they were not used to that. The people want to laugh. They don't want to cry. My story was was about crying. And and this was who were you getting this sense from the theatre community or the general public? I would say the general public mm. uh, because the artists in Kenya who practice art, those were my breath. Those were my oxygen. They wanted to sink their minds into it. They, they just want, they so, and I had one-on-one -on -one talks with a, a number of them. They said, we want to do something like this so badly. Something that awakens the art in them. Mm. And, and so I, spent, I even, I spent time with individual artists just talking with, with them one-on-one -on -one with some producers who've been just hovering around trying to figure out what do we do that is good art. Yeah. So artists wanted that. Those who practice the art wanted that. Those who are on the side of selling the business of art. Oh. oh no, this product is wrong. <laughs> this product is it is not what we want. But you want to tell them, you know, anything serious doesn't come without humor. There's a lot of so. so this is me, the artist, trying to to. <laughs> trying to base them, you know, there's a lot of humor in, 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 in what you see. Yeah, you know, trauma doesn't come without its, its, its hilarious side, its ridiculous side, rather. That didn't cut it. Um, and then you, you have the way, the way showbiz is set up in Kenya. Let me not even call it showbiz. The way the theater industry is set in Kenya is hierarchical. That is such a wrong structure. It is completely the wrong structure because you have this Kenya National Theatre that has a board that whose whose job is to take care of the structure, to take care of the house, to make sure the house is clean, wonderful. We're supposed to be good custodians of what we get, we are given in our hands, mm -hmm. but you forget there's supposed to be life in it, and art is the life in it. And that board should be responsible for making sure that it lives, that there's art that lives in that house. No, no, these, these are professionals in their fields. And some of them are professionals in the arts who, who are really just too steeped in their own life, in making excellence of their own lives. And I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying anyone shouldn't take care of that. But if you have a responsibility to take care, take care of the arts in Kenya, you've got to make sure that life is running in there. So for me, it was something very simple because I figured these people who were there were, I mean, they were extraordinary for who they were in this board. They were accomplished artists. Uh, some of them were running um, TV stations. Uh, they were either directors or they were in high positions. It was, it's very, within a year, that group alone could set up a complete season of Kenyan plays and let it run January to January. In a year, you can change the complete Nairobi art scene and make it one of the most vibrant, the best, in the, not, talk about Kenya, no, talk about East Africa and beyond. You can do that with the kind of brains that you have, but it's, you're just unwilling to do it. You don't want to see it immediately. You don't want to see it directly. So I, for me, the problem was the, the inability to make people see that you need to to be in a place to help 
storytellers tell their story. Mm -hmm. You've got Kenyan artists there who've written, some of them have written plays, some of them want to do art. Come on, just help them out. You're in the position to do that. You don't mm. need to invest so much in taking care of the structure. Just take care of the life in the house as well that needs to go on in the house. But yeah, there was that. So you hit, what kind of roadblock were you hitting? Was it that they weren't giving you the access to the facilities or they were telling you uh, to no. make permissions or? Okay, so you see, like in doing a play, so here I'm a, I am a playwright. I booked the Kenya National Theatre. Mm -hmm. So I'm coming from here, I, I decided, okay, I guess the only thing to do is I need to book the National Theatre for an entire month in order for me to be there. So mm -hmm. now I want to sell them, I'm, I want to tell them this, I shouldn't have to book the Kenya National Theatre, number one. Reason is this, you are the guys who can make a lot of headway, a lot of gains from just bringing in a Kenyan artist from any corner of Kenya or any corner of where Kenyans live, tell them you are an artist. We want your art. We want you to bring it here. We're going to pay for all the expenses because we can and we should. We give you one month. We are going to give you, uh, do you have relatives here? No. Okay, we will find someone to put you up in, in, in their room, in a house, wherever, for a month, two, three months for you to do the art. And then uh, we are going to sell, um, we're going to spend uh, three months selling tickets on TV, on radio, because we can. These guys can do that. The positions they're in, they can do that. So we're going to sell tickets for three months, make sure the house is full, so that by the time you and your artists are done, you do not have to worry about anything as the artist. The only worry you have as an artist is to tell your story. Storytelling by artists should be a communal thing, and the artists should never be bogged down with the business part of showbiz, because the business people can do that. They're able to do that. That entire board is able to do that. They're connected to the biggest TV stations. They're connected to radio. They're connected to artists. They're connected to politicians. They can decide to tell uh, Mr. Wario was was the 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 the. Uh, head or what do you call it cs uh, uh dr hassan wario he was a mm -hmm. cs then you can talk to him and tell him have all the members of parliament come to see the show tomorrow tomorrow is their is their day that can be done so just doing those things a kenyan artist should never have to worry about the business part so i was an artist who decided to worry about the business part because nobody was going to worry about it uh, so I, I put together a team of a marketing team that I decided you guys go and talk to the guys you need to talk to in order to bring in the audience. Mm -hmm. They did a phenomenal job, but they were not going to change the mindset of people in three months. No, they got me interviews. They got me in the papers. They got me on TV. Amazing work. These are ordinary Kenyans. Are you, are you what you're calling is hustlers, young ladies. Mm. And it's unbelievable the kind of work they managed to do. I, I have maximum respect for young Kenyans and the kind of work they can, I can't even pull that off in the US, what they pulled off. But even so, they can't sell tickets for those number of days within just a short period of time. So the, the, the problem with artists in Kenya is that they are forced to take part of the, to take uh, um, to do the business part of showbiz, they shouldn't. They should just be. They, they should be this 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 uh, uh, chicken that lays a golden egg that should be taken care of. Without them, you can't do it. You, without their stories, you can't do anything. Um, I, I I I wish I, I kept on t telling myself, I wish I would be given a year to run a place like this, just a year. And, and, and all the resources that they have and see if I can pull off what I know Kenyans can pull off for artists. Um, but that was just a wish out there. <laughs> so actually, I think this is the trauma you are, you are trying to put on the stage. I don't know if you can relate what you, what you experienced to right. the Kenyan trauma you are actually trying to put on the stage. I can, I can. You know, I didn't expect it though. I didn't mm. expect me to experience the trauma. I um, I thought I should be able to pull it off. 
mm. with the resources that I was coming in with, I thought this these resources should be enough to pull off something for a month and 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 leave um, hopefully leave something a footprint that I can return to and work with other artists and make it a, a you know something I can do all the time. I didn't expect to go into that kind of trauma. Um, and and as, as luck would have it, I experienced other trauma along the way that completely, completely changed my outlook. Or, or not, I don't even say I changed it. I knew it. It just put me straight into what I was trying to put on stage. Mm -hmm. um, you, have, you have time for a, a three-minute story? Listen, no, just take your time. <laughs> So I'm rehearsing with, with my artists at the Kenya National Theatre in the basement, this wonderful space that, that uh, Odero Ogan had managed to, to negotiate for. It's putting together, it's renovation. I'm there rehearsing and one of my artists comes in and uh, she was not scheduled to come in that day. So she comes in and she tells me, may I sit in for rehearsals today? I tell her, sure you can. And she is she is shaken this is morning she's completely shaken and uh i tell her i ask her what's wrong so she she was starting to talk and i realized i need to pull her aside she needs some privacy mm -hmm. and she tells me this crazy story about how the previous night she was going home and she was kidnapped at gunpoint at three o'clock in the afternoon she was kidnapped at gunpoint put in a car driven around in the night things were done to her and they dumped her and then she found her way home i believed her i could see the trauma written all over her face she was not performing this young girl was tortured in her mind in her soul i do not know if she will ever overcome that and I said, sit here, the safest place she could find in that entire world was not even her home. It was rehearsals. Rehearsals. Time spent watching other artists. That was her safe space. She stayed there all day. I told her, just don't leave until you're ready to leave. And if you need a different place to go other than home, let me know mm. because at home she was going to be asked questions she was going to be asked where were you what were you doing there was going to be victim blaming for her she couldn't take that I, it was it was it was something the most mind-blowing thing for me i got home with that in my mind the next day i get payment for the artist i have it in my bag I run to the uh, KU where I was uh, rehearsing with other artists. Uh, and from KU, I take my matatu. I use matatus throughout. They were my very convenient ways of getting around. Mm -hmm. From KU, I take my matatu back to town. And by that time, it's nine o'clock, it's going on 9.30. And I finally jump into a matatu at Audion because the matatu dropped us, us, dropped us off so far away. It's raining. I'm trying to find my way through the night streets of Nairobi, somewhere that I have no idea where I was, one dear, no idea. So I'm, I'm clutching this bag that has artist payments. I'm clutching it, running through the rain, back and forth, and this city is teeming with humanity in the night. Teeming with humanity. Some sleeping on the streets, they're coming out now. I have never seen Nairobi like this before. And I'm telling myself, shame on you, Mkawasi. This is your home. See it for what it is. See mm. it. See every human for who they are. These are your fellow Kenyans who come out in the night. This is life. These are human beings who nobody sees during the day. They come out in the night. You know, so I'm, I'm going through them. I'm going through them. I finally get myself to Audion after walking around for maybe 45 minutes or so. I sit in the Matatu. And I text my husband what happened in the night. I tell him how I survived the streets of Nairobi. And, and he says, oh, that's really nice. Cool. I tell him I'm safe. I'm on my way home. 
So as I'm texting and the matatu is weaving, going up towards Waiyaki Way, to my sister's place where I was staying, I'm texting him like this in a split second. It's dark, I've got a gun in my head, held, held to my head, yes. The driver has been thrown back. It happened in a split second. My phone has been snatched. The driver is seated next to me. There are three gunmen in the Matatu. The Matatu swerves around and is heading down, speeding to I, I don't know where. Everybody is, is, is told to take everything they have. All the bags are collected. Ah, you know, I, my, my, my ring was taken. Everything was taken, including the payments for the artists. Everything I lost, I lost my entire my. I used to carry around my studio for the play that has the sounds, that has my script, that has everything mm -hmm. all taken. My my computer, my my camera with all the footage taken, gone. So we as as we are weaving around now, I become alive. I become alive to what's going on. The lady next to me is crying her heart out. Uh, you know, I, I begin to realize this could be our end. And the guys are talking about how they're going to rape all the women. And all I'm saying is, I want to tell the guy who's holding the gun to my head, I want to tell him to just leave my ID. Because he was there putting his hands in my pockets. Because the reason I needed my ID left there is because I needed my husband to identify me. I didn't want to be lost anywhere. I didn't want that body found and no one can tell whose body it is. I, I knew, I, that was it. it. I knew that was it. So I just, I just needed, I just needed my husband to be able to say, yes, she's the one. You know, I, I didn't want him to have to look because that would have been too traumatizing for him. I had reached that stage because we were speeding somewhere in the night and I don't know where. And they already had a plan of what they were going to do. So, <laughs> I, and, and I'm thinking, I'm sorry, guys, this play is not going to go on. This is a real play right here. This yeah. is a real play. <laughs> they take us to another place uh, where they decide that they have gotten enough because they're looking through our bags. They look through my bags. The goodies are incredible in the bag that I had and others they, they just couldn't believe their loot so <laughs> so they dumped the matatu they dumped the matatu in the middle of nowhere and they slink off all of them they just disappear into this place another place that is thick with humanity and i can see sharks all over but people are just passing with their goodies coming from where women children just going about it was a slum somewhere and uh, the, the driver jumps back to the Matatu. Everyone is shaken. And now the debate in the Matatu is, do we go to the police or not? Half the passengers are saying there's no use of going. Half of them are saying we've got to go. The driver says, I have to report this because the owner of the Matatu will not believe me if I don't report it to the police. So we go around asking where we are. Finally, the driver ma makes his way to a place, uh, Ruaraka or something, after driving a long way, and we're shown a police station. We stay there until about two o'clock recording, and, and I managed to talk to most of the passengers, and I collect their stories. It's just amazing. Well, I remember particularly one architecture student who was so shaken. Why? He lost his entire portfolio. I, I, I was I was so heartbroken. I'm I, I, I I'm like, forget what I've gone. Through. I forget this. I mean, I was. <laughs> he lost his entire portfolio. I, I, it's it's like, gosh, this is this is where I almost broke it, broke down. Because all through all, I had become an observer. From the minute I had realized my life is gone, I'm looking at the last minutes of my life. I pretty much just become an observer. And, and observing people's stories and what's going on, telling the lady next to me who couldn't stop crying. I told her, it's okay, it's all right. You know, I, all the time I was just telling her, it's all right, it's okay. This young man, young student, his mind stolen, his entire work, I mean, talk about brain rape, gone. 
Another guy who was seated at the corner told me they had taken over 100,000 shillings. I was wondering, where were you taking 100,000 shillings to? But who am I? People are living their lives. People are living their lives. I, everyone had a story there. Everyone. You know, I'm talking to the, I, next I'm talking to the conductor. I had all this time because the police were recording statements. They took the time to record it. I'm asking the uh, one of the I'm asking the conductor what his story was because I'm trying to figure out were they in on this or not, and he begins to tell me. I told the driver, I told the driver this should be our last trip, but he said he has to make more money because the boss need, needs more, more money to be to be made, no. and we, I was telling yes. He, the conductor was saying it was raining and I told him we should not make another trip. I told him. So every time he just kept on saying, I told the driver, I told the driver. The driver, they have to squeeze in every coin. They have a boss who owns the Matatu. And these guys have to squeeze in every bit of the day. You know, these drivers and, 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 and conductors, they, they, they're just, they're just workers who have to meet goals. You talk about corporate, the corporate world with goals they have to meet. Target. Yes, yes, target. These guys are on target. So they, they have a schedule. They have to make, they didn't make enough yesterday. They need to make enough today. You know, they have to go around the city until they realize they're exhausted. They, they're, they're about to drop dead. So, and, and, and you know, the, the driver was a, a, a Mocorino guy, so he had his turban and they yanked it out. And, and he, that I could see just, just kind of, he dissolved into, his identity was destroyed and he's trying to tie it back on later on because that's who is, it's just, nobody cared. Nobody was caring about what you're doing to anyone. Um, I went, I went, I went now, Here's the interesting part. I make my way home about two, three o'clock in the morning. My sister and her husband are waiting for me. For me, They have no idea what happened. So I tell them the entire stories and they're completely shaken. And I'm supposed to wake up in about two, three hours for an interview at KBC. Yes. My head is pounding because the guy with the gun, someone behind had punched my head. Uh, trying to make sure I take everything out of my pockets and I don't hold anything back. And so my head was pounding with pain. My sister gives me some medicine and I tell her I have to be at the interview. I need to be. This is one of my most, inter my most important interviews ever because I need to be there. I need to tell Kenya what happened and what is happening. So <laughs> I, I make sure I get to KBC uh, very early in the morning. And they're asking me about the play. I tell them the play is about trauma. And I'm going to tell you what happened last night. And the guy who's interviewing me looks at the cameraman. He almost wants to get to cut it off because this is not what they brought me to talk about. I'm saying, I'm going to talk about this. One dear, after I started telling everyone what happened, the stories that came out were even more traumatizing because Every other person I spoke to had almost a similar story. I said, why aren't we talking about these things? How is this possible that we are all going through the same things and we're internalizing it all? How, 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 how are we even living through this? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's almost a fulfillment of your right. play. Yes, yes. Here's a connection, and it's direct. The characters in my play went through trauma, and they're living with it. And they are expected to produce excellence because one of the key guy, the key players, the little girl and, and, and the teacher, they are expected to teach excellently. They're expected to not have any excuses. They're expected not to talk about what they went through. They're expected to forget it. Uh, the little girl is not, is not even allowed to talk about her asthma. Uh, you know, she lives in this place where the environment causes her to have these problems. That's environmental trauma. 
Mm. And, and, and you're not allowed to talk about, you're just supposed to produce excellence. All she's thinking about is my voice. I need to stand there so the world can see me and, and, and look at this excellence. But they're not thinking that this girl has trauma. So her trauma cuts that, that dream off. So I'm going through this thing. One of my artists went through it and I'm expecting my artist to go on stage as if nothing happened and produce excellence. I, as a director, I'm supposed to come for rehearsals every day, take my artist through this, and I'm expected to produce excellence as a director and not talk about it because talking about it is going to come in the way. It's going to make us forget that we are supposed to, to produce excellence in this country. But we know that the trauma always comes in the way. It's coming in the way, and right now I see it coming in the way as people who are now supposed to have been bunched together as hustlers beginning to attack another class of people. That's trauma coming in the way, you know. They, they, they haven't been talking about what they're going through. There, there is no space for them to talk about what they're going through. Yeah. So it's just coming in the way. Your trauma comes in the way all the time. So every time I was talking to, to people, one of my, the guys who was, who was doing my music, he tells me a similar story. <laughs> I mean, very few people very close to me. One of my artist's mothers who was dropping us off uh, in, in her car told me a similar story. Being held at gunpoint when the door, the, the gates are opening. So middle class Kenyans can't even live without this kind of thing. And, you know, and some of them will say, but I never went through this. Me, my life is, is, is okay. I don't go through this. Yeah, well, you, you're the lucky one, you know. And even if you are, you, you still know that you need to put up walls and gates in your house to protect yourself. That in itself is middle class trauma. I call it the debris of trauma. Uh, so you, 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 no, nobody can say that I don't go through this or I'm safe or this doesn't happen in my country. We live silently, silently without trauma. So I just realized I was one of the characters in my plays. That's all. <laughs> I was one of the characters in my plays, and good thing yeah. another play came out of it. So, yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, that 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 was my experience. Five years down the line, I'm still trying to to contextualize it. I understand it, but as an artist, I'm still trying to contextualize it. Um, uh, it's it's it, I, I I understood from a very special place the gift I was given to understand the ordinary Kenyan in a way I never could have. Uh, it, it was it was a special gift to to go through that. And you know, and you know like I've also suffered trauma, but uh -huh. I didn't even know that I was suffering trauma, and and part of my my struggle right now is finding the words with which to to describe it because it sounds so ordinary and yet it is so painful right um, and i think that's where the role of the artists come in the role is of the artists is to help us put words right to what we are experiencing and yet you can't even get the play i mean it was so difficult to even get the play on the on the right. stage mm -hmm. so you know, I think that's why we sit with our traumas because the artists who are supposed to help us are even them experiencing the trauma with us, trying to put true. the expression out there. Right. It's right. so, it's so it's weird. Just, you know, and because because we choose not to talk about it, we, we, we decide that if I don't talk about it, it's going to be okay. But mm -hmm. then look at the distrust that is now playing out right now. You see, you're the kind of person who wakes up every morning and walks some miles to industrial area to spend 11, 12 hours there to earn peanuts so that you can pay for the shack in, in uh, Kibera, Korokocho, wherever it is. So you begin to mistrust anyone that owns a car. And this mistrust did not happen with the so-called Hasla dynasty division. This mistrust started a long time ago when your boss refused to give you better pay, when 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 someone when your neighbor decided to steal from you, when your child was beaten up and his lunch was stolen, 
all this trauma became part of I don't trust anyone. And it's playing out now. So it's 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 we carry things and we dump our our mistrust, our pain that's just bottled in on other people. My talking about it was my way of saying I don't want any of this. Mm. I, I don't want to have I, I don't want to have this because if I bottle it up, the person closest to me is going to bear the wrath of it. And the person closest to me is the person I live with. I'm going to not trust him or anything he does. I'm going to feel like I need to load it off of him. I'm going to be carrying this pain. If I live with relatives or anyone, the same thing. My students are going to bear the pain. And it's because of all this trauma I've decided not to talk about. I, I said I was going to talk and I talked. I told anyone I could meet the story, <laughs> whether they wanted to hear it or not. I said, say it, you know. <laughs> One of the other problems why we don't talk about it is because I don't know if you had this experience as you were sharing it. Mm. Did anyone ever tell you, use these kinds of words to tell you? They didn't tell you shut up directly, right. but where that was what they were saying, you know, oh, like dismissive, dismissive terms like uh, that's what ha always happens. Uh, even this, uh, the anchor who wanted to to stop yes. uh, recording when you are about to talk about it. So, because that's, I think, part of why we don't talk about it, because it's us who silence each other. Right. right. So, I don't know whether you experienced that. All the time. All the time. Uh, even, uh, even with people closest to you in Kenya, I, all the time. You talk, you still, you know, being a storyteller is a good thing because it, it teaches you to be deaf to to someone trying to shush you, <laughs> you mm -hmm. you. It's, I'm, I'm going to tell this story, so I, it, it it didn't matter. I was going to tell the story, uh, even even while I experienced this, you know, you don't don't tell it. One of my best experiences, and this is something I learned through through being an artist. Um, I I wish every Kenyan, or at least most of us had access to, to theater as, as, as therapy, because you learn things in life that would, are just phenomenal. One of the things I learned that I used quite often at that time was one-on-one -on -one storytelling and, and uh, creating dialogue as if the person you're telling a story to is an audience of a thousand. Um, so I did that with, with several people and what happened with that is I got stories back. That's, that's how I started to realize the number of stories that were so similar in, in trauma. Uh, because I, I, I was able to get people to say, you know, on this particular day, this and this and this happened to me too. And, and it was all unraveling. And I, I, I can honestly say, with all honesty, were it not for my background as a storyteller, as a trained storyteller, trained in, 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 the, in the professional, serious way of what it means to tell and to be a listener. Had I not be a, been a trained storyteller, I would not have been able to do that. I would have dismissed it all. I'm so glad you've talked of training because it is so hard to get arts programs surviving in Kenya because people feel that storytelling is something everybody does. So why do you need the training? Yeah. Why do you need the expertise and, and to put your time into developing that right. skill? Mm. Right. right. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's a skill. Mm. It's a skill that, that is studied. It has been studied by experts. It has been put to test. Uh, so it, it's something that it's, it's a philosophy. It's it's for crying out loud. It's not it's not something that comes naturally. Mm. <laughs> no, it's my, not. Much as you might have talent in something, you may not have the knowledge, mm. the expression, the philosophy, the comparisons. How mm. do people? And this other part, how did so and so manage to tell stories? How did they, how did that how did a traumatized Europe manage to tell stories out of their trauma of war, a trauma of of, of ethnic uh, uh, and tribal wars? How did they manage to do that? 
in, in, in homes, in, in private settings, in, in private theaters, in their basements. Uh, you know, I, I remember one of them, um, Vaslav Havel is one of my, my, best, uh, my best politicians. He died, of course. He was a storyteller. He was in this tr Europe of trauma where theaters had become little spaces in people's homes uh, where you could gather with an audience of five, ten, and, and put up this play, uh, uh, read the story, this script, and that built into a movement. And he, as, as, as a playwright and a director, he, he ran this movement, became the president that, that, that saw Czechoslovakia through this, uh, this split, and it became one of the best ever. And after he retired from his presidency, he went back to directing. He said, oh, I'm going back to my storytelling. It, it's, it's beautiful to mm. see artists in this wholesome place that art allows you to understand politics, uh, uh, what the stories that are going on in every field, in the science field, in everything, and allows you to see the possibilities of a country and mm -hmm. to know that taking on uh, a job like leading a country is just another job. It doesn't have to come attached with this strange power as if I, I'm supposed to become a god. No, it's just another job you take on the same way uh, uh, someone who, who, who goes to a factory to run a certain machine has to do it and do it excellently. And after I'm done with my five or ten years, I retire. I go back to storytelling if I'm a storyteller, no to whatever I do. And that's it. Mm. It's, about, it's about bettering human beings where they are. So that this, I guess it gets me to, to the level of where I realize, I know, I know Kenyans have to really reconceptualize what a presidency is. Um, it's something what? we borrowed. Yeah, it's something we borrowed from the West, and it, it's mm -hmm. so dysfunctional. Mm. Figuring out a presidency, it's just so completely dysfunctional. We haven't figured it out. It consumes our society's energies, right. imaginations. Right. Can you imagine instead of imagining a cure for COVID, we are trying to figure out uh, who, how are we going to decide the president in 2022? It's madness. I mean, it's, it's, it's just another job. Come on. <laughs> Come on. We have what we need to know how we're going to pick our next president. We do that if the person doesn't. And we have, we, the, our constitution, our laws allow us to remove somebody who doesn't do a, a good job. It should be that simple. But I, I know it's not that simple. Uh, uh, you know? And, and, you know, as artists, I love spontaneity because we didn't plan to go with this. <laughs> but it works. It really works. Because yeah. I'm going to ask you about uh, traveling and home. Because it right. seems Kenyans have, have expo export sometimes. I'm not sure. It's like we export our traumas. Right. We go to them. And then we make demands of, of each other, whether yeah. we are in Kenya or whether we are outside. So maybe, um, first, maybe you can tell us how you landed in the US, how you ended up calling the US home. Right, right. We'll go to that famous essay that broke the banks in, <laughs> I think, 2013, which was written <laughs> by Biko Zulu about home. Because right, right. one of the points you made in your response was that you know, I set up home in, Kenya is my home. I've set up home in the U.S. and I don't have to apologize for that. Right. Okay. So you said I started with how I landed here, like most Kenyans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my landing here was looking for, uh, was academic. Uh, I came here to do my, my graduate degree in theater arts. The most interesting thing about it is that I had, I had an option. I had an option to go to Makerere because uh, I, I had an opportunity there. And uh, I forget the lady's name who was the professor who was running the, the, the department then of performance studies. And I very nearly went there, except that it was uh, easy enough for me to go to the US because I had relatives there. I had relatives in, in, uh, in New York. 
and that was the so-called center of theater. Mm. I want to go to Broadway, see what is going on. Uh, but I went kicking and screaming because <laughs> it was the third time around. I, I, had, I had refused twice to go. I, I just wasn't seeing myself there. I was enjoying my life in Kenya. I had everything I needed. But so anyway, I went. Uh, saving grace was that I had family there. And, and uh, when I joined the college, my, my first order of business was to figure out how I was going to pay my second term fees. Uh, the first term fees, uh, thankfully, my aunt paid that. And I, I told her, I'm going to pay it back. Uh, I, I, I needed to do that for myself. I don't know if it was ego or what. Uh, maybe it was. Uh, but I did do that eventually. Now, here's where the diaspora experience starts. When you realize that you do not have the village in Kenya that is going to, to do all these harambees and keep bailing you out. So you have to look for that job to pay for your fees for the next semester until you finish. Mm. So having that in mind, you have to look for, uh, to see what, anything you can do. Now that is where we begin to experience these jobs that Kenyans up at home say, oh, I hear you're doing this. I hear you're cleaning toilets. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, uh, oh, you went there to do this. But you have a very specific goal. Yeah, you know, you need to get your degree done. So I, I went to, this is a, an interesting story. I went to, I walked down the street uh, and there was this notice up at a restaurant that said help, help wanted. So I went in there and asked them what they want. They said, look, they're looking for a dishwasher. So I said, oh, I can wash dishes. What are you paying? $250 a week. I do a quick calculation in my head. I realize if I do this entire summer, that, that already gives me my fees for the entire semester, next semester. So now that means I only have one more year to do and I'm done with my master's and I come back home. Good. So I tell them, oh, I can wash dishes. And the guy looks at me and he says, no, you can't. I said, I've washed dishes in my life before. He says, this is a restaurant. Um, it, these are different kind of dishes. I said, give me a, a chance. So he tells me, okay, come tonight. So I go there and there are sufurias the size of a cathedral. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and plates piling up like Mount, you know, whatever. And I quit in two hours. What? Yes, I quit in two hours. I could not do that job. To date, anytime I go into a restaurant, I know there's someone breaking their backs in their washing dishes. And I know that because I experienced it for two hours and could not do it. It's so funny. I wrote a post about that today, about the cleanup work we don't appreciate. You, it's, it, and you know, I'm thinking these mm. jobs, uh, these were what used to be called an, uh, uh, under the table jobs because, because you get these jobs and uh, they're not written off. Your, your, your employer doesn't get, they don't pay benefits so, so that uh, there's no tax on it for them. So mm. uh, you go there. You do this job, you have no health insurance. After a month, yes, you have no health insurance, no benefits. After a month, you know a dishwasher's back is broken. <gasps> yes, you know that, and you have no health insurance. So unless this is a job that comes as a full-time job, paying you a decent salary and health care, that is the only way there's respect in it. But if half the dishwashers in restaurants do not have those jobs as full-time jobs, it becomes a rotational work job. They're going to quit after two months, after three months, they're going to quit because their backs have given off. They, 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 they can't stand anymore. Mm. So that is what capitalism has become, a rotational thing because workers can't handle it in, anymore. All industries have that, including including colleges. Ah, mm. So th that's, that's how it happened. I said, okay, I'm, I need to get a job where I won't break my back and can actually pay my fees. Mm. So, so it was a good thing. It was before 9-11. So there are all these opportunities, luckily. And I managed to get a job, uh, uh, another job in, in, a, in a bookstore 
was a lot of uh, wonderful job, but it, it had a lot of standing. You had to stand a lot and my back couldn't handle it. And, and so I had to leave it after three months too. I mean, Andy, I'm telling you, these are people we call lazy because they're earning little money. This is so unfair. And I, I could afford to quit because I had other skills in teaching. So much as I enjoyed the books, I enjoyed the passengers. It was a bookstore in a in a in a um, an airport. I could read all kinds of books. I had I, I collected a huge library because of the 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 what I got off um, what do you call it discounts, and, and and the manager was pleased. I was going up the ladder. They were going to give me better a better job and all that. So it was coming with benefits, but I could afford to teach. So I got an, a better job teaching. And I stuck there because I loved it. Uh, and, and that helped me continue paying my fees. Every time I decide, you know, I, I say I'm ready to go home, just something happened. You, you, are, you, you are crew bills. You, you have to pay for where you're living. You have to, all that. So you're chasing, you're always chasing something. And as you're chasing something, life unfolds. Mm -hmm. Life unfolds, you meet people, you fall in love, you, you, you have another family here, community grows. And you 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 realize you have a home, um, and that's how home is established. It's it's established by by life giving you love, and and when life gives you love anywhere, be it Beijing, in Timbuktu, wherever, then life plants a home for you there. Mm. You know. And, and, and you can't take anyone from that. You can't take that away from someone. You mm -hmm. can't tell someone, quit, quit thinking that's your home. So I'm sorry, but this is my gift. <laughs> this is my gift. You know, and I, you are saying in this, this right. uh, response, isn't it? Right. right. This is it's my gift. My home, I, I have, life has given me this. And because life gives you that, it also comes with obligation. Gifts come with obligation. Oh, we fail to, 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 to think through that. And the obligation where you plant your home is to also expand your presence with, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. knowing who's around, expanding community, because you can never come singular. Part of the problem with Kenyans coming here and thinking they can survive here without community is, 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 that, is that they become... Um, so withdrawn and and you 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 think you you sh it's like you shut your windows you shut your doors and you have this little space and you want to make all the money you can make in this little home and anytime you have trouble you think people should come to you that can't happen so some people have managed to create communities it's another it's another uh, politics altogether how kenyans create community here but the easiest way they have found to create community is is through uh, ethnic enclaves abroad yes, yes. That, that's that's the that's, that's the simplest insurance it's social insurance mm. they don't have to work too hard because yes. because creating community with with americans your neighborhood has americans uh, uh europeans uh, muslims all kinds of people creating community with them is is too hard a job and you don't want to do that job so what do you do uh, you you figure out where if I'm a Kikuyu, I figure out where the other Kikuyus are. It's easier that way. So this social insurance doesn't need too much emotional and psychological work, and so we become a Kikuyu community. And it demands that you keep others out because immediately you create this community uh, of of say a Kikuyu community. It demands that you keep the Luos out, the Kalenjins out. Oh, yeah. Those ones have to form their own communities. And that is how come we have such vibrant ethnic churches, a vibrant Kalenjin church, Luo church, Luya church, Kamba church, because they, they, they realize this is the simplest formula to do it abroad. And you keep each other away. And in keeping each other away, you, you develop um, enmity. We develop uh, enemies you shouldn't have had. Developing a Kenyanness is one of the most difficult things to do abroad. It, it is so hard. It's almost impossible. So you begin to live in these kind of, of spaces 
where Kenyanness disappears. And this is an argument I make, uh, I make a lot, even in, in academia, about the disappearance of, of African nationalities the minute you step out of Africa. They're not real. They, they become just these conceptualized things that colonialists came with. Kenya ceases to exist the minute Kenyans leave Kenya. Yes, and, and, this, and, and you know, there are other things that try to put us together with, you know, whatever it is that we try to bring together. We, we try to fight for it. We try very hard to fight for it. But you know, it's a, it's a hard thing to do. So anyway, here I am, uh, knowing that I have a home here and uh, for a reason. Uh, if, if I didn't have the gift of love, the gift of family, the gift mm. of community, then mm. I would not have a home here. And mm. most people, uh, the, the nature of dispersal, the nature of dispersed humans is even if you find yourself alone in any place far away from where you call home, you naturally reach out to someone even if it's a total stranger, and the two of you create a bond. And then the next thing you know, you've reached out to a third person. And that creates a gift of love that plants a home for you. So even for a lot of us Kenyans who are running away from the concept of this is not home, it becomes home for you. And I sit down with friends and they tell me, my children were born here, they went to school here, this is home. And they mm. finally accept it. That mm. doesn't mean that home stops being home. No, the children still go back home. I have students in my classes who par whose parents are, are, some of their parents are teachers, and they tell me about going to visit Kenya. And the idea that they think that is home too. Th th these are people who are not born there. These are Kenyan Americans. Th their parents are from a completely other country other race, whatever you want to say, but, but the, the fact that they have this connection, they realize, oh, I have a home somewhere else too. Um, home is where there is love, where you've planted people who accept you. So that's what it is. <laughs> so um, when, when you have the Kenya diaspora uh -huh. in the U.S., what is happening? Can you explain what that is in terms of the dynamics that you have just talked about? Because, um, okay, yeah, because uh, like now, so you're, uh, they are pushing for the right to vote, and I completely agree. Right. So, what what dynamic? What are what is what are we saying philosophically when right. we make that that right. demand? Uh huh. Okay, so this is this is where issues unite us. Um, the politics of the Kenyan diaspora, I would say, took root around the year two thousand. That's when that's when we started uh, becoming organized around issues, and that allowed us to start uh, thinking of ourselves as Kenyans. And by that time, uh, ethnic enclaves had not started establishing themselves the way they have. The reason they're so strong is because the Kenyan community has increased in numbers. So when the population increases, it comes with its challenges. So anyway, the, the thing that, that pushed us to, what we started with, with was the push for dual citizenship. And, and that had also come with, uh, that, that actually came, came after our push for justice in Kenya. This is a funny thing. When we started organizing ourselves as the Kenyan community abroad, um, our main goal was what was going on in Kenya because we had left a country that was steeped in, in political, economic ravages, you know, who was under police state and all that. And Solomon Muruli had just gotten killed and we were like, now we need to do something. So what was going on in Kenya is what put us, put us, brought us together. And then we realized we, a lot of us are here to stay. So we decided because we're so connected to our country, we need to establish our rights as mm -hmm. citizens who are connected to two places. Uh, we need the social contract in writing because we realize there'll never come a time when we will stop caring for the people back home. We are connected to them for the number of years that we are on this earth. 
So we said we need a dual citizenship. We need Kenyans to recognize that. As luck would have it, there was this uh, fight for uh, a new constitution. So ours was a fight that came, uh, that was just historically right, was came at the very right time. Because it was such a foreign idea to a lot of uh, Kenyans and, and legislators in Kenya, uh, we, we had to have delegates. So we, we got ourselves the delegates that went to Kenya, they were in bombers and they fought for this idea of dual citizenship. We went through a lot with the president then, Kibaki, and Kibaki was telling us, what is this crazy idea you have? No, you're not going to have anything like that. You can't have one foot in Kenya and one foot here. And we, we and even our own fellow Kenyans in the diaspora, they're fighting against us, they're saying, this is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You can't do this. So we, uh, there, there was an educating that was also needed. Uh, and mm -hmm. we were saying, because dual citizenship was translated as Kukana Uzalendo, you, you're living, you, you're saying that you can be two, you can pledge allegiance to two masters. Uh, that's really not the issue. It, the issue is, is to realize that forever human beings will always be transient. You'll be moving from place to place. Uh, Europe realized that a long time ago, so they have multiple citizenships. Uh, you know, you, you come to that realization, you know, okay, maybe this is something that can work. Um, good thing it worked. We lobbied enough and it worked. So dual citizenship set us off to a place where we know we can be anywhere in the world mm -hmm. and and be able to be uh, to, to be the responsible citizens of Kenya that we need to be. How can you not demand being responsible when you're sending money home for things like uh, uh, fees, hospital bills, uh, matumizi and nyumbani? These are things middle class, so called middle class Kenyans do every day. Uh, they, 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 they take care of this. They carry the bulk of Kenya on their shoulders. So we are just, we just happen to be a thousand miles farther away from our sisters living there. And we're doing the same things they do. It's just the, the geographical distance that makes a difference. Mm. Uh, but what dual citizenship does for us, it, it, what, it, it makes it so that you don't forget we are part of Kenya. Mm -hmm. and the, the rights and responsibilities of citizenship are, are, are also ours to have. Um, so I don't know where we were going with this question, but that's that's where we started. Yeah, um, maybe just comment on uh, some some of the issues that. Okay, first of all, you you've mentioned people saying you can't serve two masters. What's mm -hmm. that about? Is citizenship about ah, having no. a master? It, it's it's about patriotism. The fact that that a country, the concept of of a nation, is seen as is seen as uh, a master. As well, like 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 in uh, in in the U.S., this is very well structured in in U.S. politics, uh, white white politics. It's structured as God, country, family. So that country is human, is a human entity. You know, and 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 country as a human entity is someone to whom you not only owe allegiance, uh, that there is a blood connection to it. And, 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 and that, is, that is why uh, white people see the only blood connection to a country like the US ought to be the blood relatives we have as white people. Uh, so this God country thing is very clear in white politics. And it, it, it is something that, that uh, we inherited as well when the concept of nationhood uh, became sovereign nationhood, became our reality uh, post-independence. And we are thinking, oh, God, country, tribe. Or is it God, country, me? Or is it country, God? We are still trying to figure out what it is. But country is there. And the concept of it being, uh, having a personification to whom we owe allegiance is what creates this dual master thing. Like, oh, you have a master, America, and you have a master called Kenya. You cannot serve both. No, it is just an idea of a place where you live. And the idea of a country is to create space where we as human beings who live within that space can achieve the best as human beings. This is what I'm hearing, which I think is so fascinating. You want a Kenya that is not limited to its borders. Yes. 
Yes, of- we are absolutely. Uh, we want, uh, and that goes to a world that is not limited to its borders. And if, if there's one thing this young generation has taught us, uh, I, I don't know what where it's reached. I don't know if now it's now Generation Z or A or B. One thing they're teaching us right now is the foolishness of of geographical borders. Mm-hmm. I'm, they, I'm, they know it. They're seeing it. They're living in it. They're living in the reality of of this world is just this dot where you have human beings on it. And what these borders should do for us is help us manage our affairs the best way possible. Because, you, I mean, you, you can't say I'm going to manage the world. No, you you, you need a space to say I'm, I'm going to manage just this. So that's mm. all it should do for us. Mm. It, it, it should it should help us manage this space well. I cannot say, oh, I'm, I'm such a, a conscientious human being that I want to manage the affairs of France and, and Haiti and South Africa, as well as Kenya, because I love everyone. I need a space to do that, to mm-hmm. give me that, that, that connection, that responsibility. So, so Kenya is my responsibility because I inherited that space called Kenya. It, w- it was created through trauma, yes, but we choose, do we want to keep it? Yeah, is it a good idea to keep it? Yes, so we're still struggling with that. Ah, maybe it's not a good idea because, no, it is a good idea to keep it because it helps us. It doesn't, you don't have to think about the trauma through which Kenya became to be Kenya, but we can think about what it can do for us. So, mm. yeah. That's poetry. You're asking us to think like poets. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's something I've, I've wondered. Okay, uh-huh. Kenyans, Kenyans abroad want to have, to be part of what is happening in Kenya, but do you guys lobby for us, for the people in the U.S. Congress and those places where foreign decisions on foreign policy are made on Kenya? Because it seems the U.S. is constantly against the people. Good question. Now, just 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 to correct the the, the first part you, you said that Kenyans want to be a part of what's going on in Kenya. We are a part of it, mm-hmm. so we can't want it. That's true. Yeah, we can't want it, whether we like it or not. The only way someone might argue that that I'm not a part of it mm. and I want to be a part of it is is if everything that ever connected you to Kenya has disappeared, doesn't exist anymore. Everything means your family, a, a, a rift opened, the rift valley opened and swallowed your entire family and, and they, they don't exist anymore, God forbid. And 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 um, your friends, all the friends that you knew and had an emotional connection to, they all disappeared into thin air. They don't exist anymore. And all you have of Kenya is a memory. Even even if if that memory is erased by trauma in the head that decides to erase that memory, then you can say I have nothing to do with Kenya, but I would love to have a connection. So we Kenyans abroad cannot extricate ourselves from that. We know we are involved in Kenya. Mm. So the, the thing, what Kenyans abroad do is, is try to make this understandable that I want you to understand that I'm already connected to that country. I want you mm. to understand that and you can't remove that. I can't even erase it if I tried, <laughs> you know, I, 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 can't, I can't keep quiet. I, sometimes, and sometimes we do because there is so much that is involved in trying to, to survive here that you want to just erase everything that is happening in Kenya so you can just survive at least. But then tomorrow your your little nephew or your neighbor's child needs only $50 to finish their education and graduate. So you, you send it. That's your connection right there. You're just doing a citizen thing. You know, you're doing a family thing. So then it comes to where we are right now. The politics of America are complicated politics. For Kenyans in the diaspora, we are just at the very beginning of beginning to un- starting to understand how to make an impact. If we take a diaspora like, say, the Jewish diaspora, which is the best example I can give, there are other diasporas as well. Mm-hmm. When they started trying to have an impact in the U.S. for the benefit of Israel, they were divided in different groups. I mean, they they had so many different groups and infighting. Uh, 
I remember we had a meeting with with the with the, with the Jewish diaspora um, in, in one of their main organizations. Um, some some it was just and luckily the the Kenyan ambassador had set it up, and so we were just a few Kenyans in a boardroom, and they were telling about, uh, us about their history, and um, and and how difficult it was not difficult impossible it was to create this thing called a united voice of the diaspora. So they learned to woo power uh, through Congress, and and. Uh, through years and years of lobbying, they finally managed to create uh, an organization that the that, that, uh, the the Congress could not could not shut down, could not deny, and and they, they so it was, took years of building up, and that is what Kenyans abroad can do. You can take years of diligently building yourself up through connecting yourself with congressmen. Uh, you do this through looking for those who are now dual citizens, who are American citizens. Um, and actually, it shouldn't take much. It's just, just 10 Kenyans who decide to call their Congress members and begin to say, we are 50 of us in this, in this uh, county. We are, we are 100 of us in this, in this uh, state. Uh, we will give you our votes and you just keep at it. In another five, 10 years, we will have the kind of power you can pick up a phone and tell your Congress member, Stop sending money for BBI. I don't know who's funding BBI. I'm just saying this as, a, as an example. Mm -hmm. You can pick up the phone and say, stop spending money to buy arms uh, to arm the, 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 the military who are attacking people in, I don't know, Somalia or whatever it is. You can do that I, it, because it, that's how it's done. But we don't have the numbers yet. We are okay. still very young in figuring out the politics of influence. And so every time telling people, talking to people and showing them this is how the game is done, then hopefully with, with time, it will become, it be, it'll become a reality. Uh, mm -hmm. Without that, we are stuck with the individuals, we singular people talking to the Department of State. I know I can pick up the phone and talk to someone in the Department of State and try to influence something, but it's just that that's me. Uh, mm -hmm. I can say this is happening, this is going on. I can force someone to look at what's going on in Kenya and maybe something can happen. Before I used to do the, that and make sure and, and sometimes tell the embassy, oh, this is what is, I'm having a meeting with so-and-so, so I keep them in the know. I, I stopped doing that because <laughs> I realized sometimes they weren't even interested. So it's, it's a game of figuring out how to play the power, the power game in the U.S. That's it. Okay. Um, now we want to go to the, the, you've already kind of touched on it on work. Uh -huh. Uh, we, you, a number of us got involved in this conversation that was started about uh, sending Kenyans abroad. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe could you just tell uh, listeners what what was your issue with this particular uh, suggestion from Mohammed Hersi right. about about uh, uh, sending Kenyans ab abroad to work and then paying a tax back. My goodness. Where do we start with this? The whole idea, where it came from, the, men the mindset it came from, that you can take your citizens who are jobless and strike a deal with another government to employ them goes completely counter to the idea of why you have citizens in the first place. The reason a government is in government is because citizens gave them the power to do that, to be in, parliament, in, 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 in government. Now, there's always this contract, this social contract between a citizen and their government. And this, we know about a social contract, where I'm giving you the power to be uh, my leader and in exchange, you're going to make it possible for me to have access to infrastructure, jobs, security, to have the kind of things that allow me as a citizen to live a human dignified life so that I'm not an animal living out there, homeless, hungry, and fighting for scrounges, just scrounging around for scraps. That's a social contract. I'm bringing you into power so you can do this. And then after I have signed that social contract with someone I have put in power, they come and tell me, mm, I can't give you what you have contracted me to do. I need to send you to someone else so that you can get it. 
But I did not sign a contract with Europe, with Saudi Arabia, with the US. I signed a contract with my government so that you can give me these things which will allow me simple human dignity. I do not want to live, to, 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 to live this place, to leave my loved ones, to leave my mother and my father and my whatever, and go to another country to look for money so that I can take care of my loved ones. I expect you to do that. So that is the first thing. It was extremely mm -hmm. insulting, not just insulting, but it came from a very ignorant place that we have leaders in Kenya who do not understand that social contract. It's the most basic lesson in politics. There is no politician, no leader who cannot understand the social contract that you have with your citizens. If there's any leader who doesn't understand the social contract, they have no business being in leadership at all. Now, here's a good example which they should know. Our relationship with our country is not different from our relationship with our families. Nature played a very interesting game on us. This is because nature's, nature's goal is to replicate and survive, is, is, is to have this, uh, what Christians call, what, what, let me see, try and remember what Christians call, uh, the lie, the kind of space to, to glorify and praise the higher power. So that, you know, Christianity tells you that, that you have a God and all that God wants is for you to praise. That is the equivalent of, of being alive, that all we want, all that nature wants of us is to praise, to be alive. And the only way we can do that is if we are, first of all, just able to live within that dignity of, of humanity, being a human being, I can eat, I have shelter or, or shelter, a roof over my head, and I'm clothed. Just that. I can wake up in the morning and say, ah, I can praise the day. I can worship the sun, whatever, whoever it is I worship. I can pour a libation to my ancestors because I feel alive. Now, I was saying nature played a funny game on us. It realized that the best way a human being can survive, can thrive, can live a human life is to create this thing called family. So when a child is born, that child has a parent. That parent has an obligation. Whether you look at your child and realize, oh, I did not want a child that looks like this. No, oh, it doesn't matter. You can hate that child all you, like, all you want. You have an obligation to that child. Mm -hmm. You know, you have that obligation. And that's what nature did. Give us this obligation between parent and child. So it doesn't matter how you feel about that child. It's your obligation to take care of it. And the good thing about nature is that it gave us the ability to love. So we have this insurmountable love for the people we are connected to. And so we love them and take care of, we break up, we can die for them. What human beings did is realize that they need to expand this contract between family, parent, child. So when you create a community, you realize, oh, the, the elders have a responsibility towards the villagers. They have to make sure that we are safe. Mm -hmm. They have to make sure that the laws are followed. And then you create something called a country. Same structure. The government has a responsibility towards their citizens. It is the exact same structure that nature created. All we're doing is replicating nature. So if you have a government that is telling its citizens, go away, I don't have anything for you here. That is a mother, a father chasing away their child telling them I gave birth to you, but I have no muzzle of food in my sufuria because I ate it all, because I, I struck a deal with my neighbor over there so that my neighbor can come and eat all the food so I can drive his car. There's no more food for you here. Go somewhere else and look for food on your own. And as you look for that food on your own, when you find it, you have an obligation to send some of that food to me. Mm -hmm. 
You get? <laughs> you get? So that 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 is why that con- it was just it it weighed heavy, heavy in my mind. We have to understand, and that if you talk about patriotism. Patriotism is the same filial love that we have, that nature gifted us with. This is only, it's just that we, we expand this love to, to a country so that what my mother feels for me, that natural feeling, we have transformed it into patriotism so that we feel that same love for our country. And it is a love that says, I admonish you when I need to admonish you. I, 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 and, and, and the government can tell you, I, I need to, 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 to tell you to work hard here so that we can make this country work. I need to, to enforce uh, the rules of, 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 uh, of whatever rules we need to enforce so that we can work together in harmony. That's what we are expecting, but that's not what Kenya is doing. And what we're seeing is that Kenyans are real, uh, uh, Kenyans who are supporting those people are saying, oh, yeah, 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 we have no jobs here. It's okay for the government to chase us out. They're in a sense saying, ah, oh, yeah, really, there's no connection here. The, this is not family. This you is, have this no is, relation to me. No, no, you have no relation to me. You have no relation to me. You know, when, when you have corporate uh, corporate world, uh, doing what they call headhunting, which is the funniest word I ever heard. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so true. You hunt people's heads. There's none to do with humanity. Uh, when you have corporates looking for headhunting, they come and poach the best of brains, uh, uh, even other governments from other countries. Um, that is that is the nature of 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 um, of jungle politics. Uh, a country realizes, uh oh. You need more brains. You need better, better brain power. So what the U.S. does, well, the U.S. will always create these laws, uh, immigration quarters, even the green card lottery, where they porch brains, they porch workers. Like you know, the green card lottery, you, you, they, they, they are specific. It's not a lottery, really. <laughs> you, you have to have at least a high school a diploma or, or a two-year degree in order for them to bring you from those countries to their countries because they need that brain power. So this is this is this is the animal, this is the country, the parent called America trying to push the best of children from other places so that those children can make this this family called America healthier. And we are we are saying, all right, give give them away. Give them our children. What are we doing? What are we doing? We we should, we should be doing the opposite. Let's go get our children from where they are in the best way we can, you know? So uh, that, that's what, and then, and then the second thing about it, the myth me about that, that post was a thousand dollars. So oh, yeah, who, 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 a thousand dollars is a thousand who, shillings. Who has a thousand dollars in their accounts? <laughs> to send every month. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it's, uh... I, I discovered a few years ago that actually the reason why the government thinks like that is because it's, it's the export um, formula. Raw materials from Africa, you export them. So now raw materials are not only tea and coffee, now they've become human beings. Yeah. And, and when you now connect that to the middle passage, it means that's trauma. Yeah. It is. It's not different at all. It's it's the same thing, because those those who who helped uh, ship other Africans out, they benefited from that. Mm. Huge, huge benefits. And it's the same thing they're suggesting. The only reason they're suggesting you send more Kenyans out there is for the benefits that they think they're going to get. They've even calculated it all. They've calculated the benefits. See this Mohammed Helsi uh, uh, article. He calculated the benefits. It comes down to numbers. Yeah. All comes down to numbers. And you know, um, Africa didn't develop. We didn't develop by selling our people abroad. No. no. So, so, and, and we are still paying actually the the the, the results of that yes. mistake we made. Right. So to think that we can now do it again, but think this time it will work because it's dollars being yeah. sent. Yeah. It's the same trauma that slaves suffered. Uh, coming here, the disconnect from their family, is the same trauma 
that you sending an entire group of Kenyans suffer. It's the same trauma, the That's disconnect, true. the distancing, the, the, the thinking, you know, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible. Mm. You know, it, if, if you begin to dig into the kind of disconnect that Kenyans in the, the diaspora go through before they finally establish themselves in a place, it's huge. And you're saying, I don't care what you go through out there. Yeah, just go work. Go send money. Go work, send money. At least you're earning something. At least it's better than living here. You know, human beings, Kenyans without jobs, they will always be looking to move away. The only, and this is what something people don't understand. The reasons Kenyans would be are leaving, uh, trying to leave Kenya in droves to look for jobs is not for that money. They're trying to escape the indignity of not being able to live as human beings. It's unfortunate that that indignity is connected to a salary, but they're trying to escape that indignity of waking up and you can't feed your family. Waking up and you know the landlord is about to chase you out. Waking up and you're three, four months in arrears with your rent, with fees, that is indignity. And you are willing to go anywhere in the world to wash whatever toilets, do or spend whatever amount of time away from your family to make it work. And a lot of Kenyans have done this. They have disconnected from their families. They work here. I can name names. They work here. They have spent years, decades, sending money home for the mother to build the, the family home, educate the children. And what it has become is just a mother flying back home, back and forth to their families, or a father flying back and forth to see children they have not seen grow. They didn't see their children grow up. I, I remember a recent story where in Kenya where a, a young man killed his entire family, mm. almost his entire family. And the mm. father was a nurse in the US. So it's, it's that kind of setup where, where you are earning the money. You have to suffer this trauma of dispersal in order for your family to eat, to have a roof of their head, over their head, to go to school, to have a chance in life. You have to disconnect yourself from family for all these years. You lose all that. And that is what they're suggesting. But you know, I think now, at least from your experience with the play, you've seen we've separated questions of dignity from from questions of work. Yeah. That's how we are able to keep this contradiction. When it comes to dignity, I'll talk about it in a different space, but don't bring it up when it comes to work. And yet work is about dignity. Yeah. You're going out because, you, like you're saying, the, the conditions here are so indignifying yeah. You do anything to restore that dignity, even if it means working abroad. And and to return that kind of conversation to the public consciousness. Right. That's a work of artists, but you, you <laughs> so got a very hard time trying trying to do it. It's, it's oh. going to work out sometime. Oh, 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 you know, I'm, I haven't given up. You know, I have a lot of... We can't. Yeah, yeah. It, there has to be a return. There has to mm. be a return. So, mm -hmm. right. This has been such a wonderful conversation. It it has gone spontaneously. <laughs> it's even better. Um, so I I think next time I I hope there'll be a next time we can talk about U.S. politics. Yeah. Uh, what does it mean to be uh, an African in a place where there are other Africans who have come before us and are very. Right circumstances what does that mean in terms of connecting again and what are the lessons we should learn from this side because oh, i feel very bad that we don't know yeah. the history of, yeah. of older diaspora well we don't even know ours but we all... i mean that, that's that's my field of study so <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah uh, uh, disposals is, is my field of study Especially oh. between the, the, the comparison between uh, the the black diaspora, they call it black Atlantic, and and 
what I would call the airlift Africa diaspora. Mm. There, there's, there's a, it, it's interesting. So we, we, we can we can talk about that next time. Yeah, and then hopefully, you know, even as the Kenya diaspora fights uh, for us to recognize its presence already, yeah, then we can extend that to that the older diaspora. Right. So even our brothers and sisters don't find it so hard to come back home. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, you, you, there, there, there's a, there's just briefly, there, there's a, a wave of, of them trickling back to Africa. Um, and of course, Ghana is doing it better. Polish mm. has helped. Uh, in Kenya, you've got this small trickle. It's very, very, percentage-wise, maybe 0 0.01, but there's a trickle. And they need a policy that allows them to actually explore their home, uh, what they can call home, at least. Because mm. even that, you, 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 talk, you talk about Kenyans trying to figure out a home here. They're still struggling about home. They're still struggling about figuring out home, you know. Mm. That, that 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 question, that County Cullen question that he asked, what is Africa to me? Uh, in, in that poem, Heritage. Mm. That is a question that is still grappling with them. For an African-American to, after centuries, to ask what is Africa to me and go ahead and, and conceptualize it in, in the most, uh, in such emotional and psychological depths. You know, this is a connection that will never go away for them, never. But at mm. least now, this is a time that they're beginning to trickle back in a way that they say, "Ah, oh, I'm going to claim that that my piece of home there." Mm. Mm. And you know, by the way, the Ke I know I have a friend who the Kenya government has just frustrated him oh. in trying to get his papers. He's married. Oh. You know, they are giving him such a hard time. It's so oh. embarrassing. So embarrassing. That's bad. It's terrible. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Mm. Yeah, that, those are the politics I hope I can be engaged in someday. You, okay. you, you, know, my, you know my feeling about anybody black. <laughs> they, they gave me a home. They gave me love. I, I you know, I, I have obligations, responsibilities, uh, or whatever you want to call it. Mm. Right. So. All right. I, I forgot to tell you this. I don't know whether I'm going to cut you off guard normally and especially when it comes to artists i ask them to give us a blessing or a poem or so that we can finish on that note ah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry i i i i know I, I i forgot to tell you that yeah oh my goodness you know i you know what i used to say um in 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 politics when i'm when i when i get a visit um which which this is what is uh you you visited me <clears throat> it's exactly what you've done and and when i know very well that whenever we got visitors at home that my mother never once let the visitor go away without something in a basket either the same basket they came with she'll put something in it mm. or we'll take our own basket and she'll put something in it so um that is always the, the case with a visit i just got a visit from home all the way from kenya i've spent i don't know how much time i've spent with you and it's been a wonderful visit and so i in this basket that i have to give to you to take back to kenya i'm putting hope in it I'm putting, there's a word I'm trying to give this. I, 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 I want to say, uh, I want to say endurance. Uh, but, but I will use it all the same. I'm putting endurance in it because I know that you're in a battle. Um, I know that it's a battlefield that has a long way to go. So I'm putting in this basket endurance. Um, that all the fight, the bullets, the spears that will come at you, that you will have a Kinjakatila jacket <laughs> that can repel them. Just stay focused because there is this filial love of country that we call patriotism that keeps you in that field. And um, 
Finally, in this basket, I put love. Uh, love of, uh, of, of uh, a fellow country person, uh, love of sisterhood, love of humanity, and, um, and, 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 and I hope that these will be things that you can feed on in this basket. And may they nourish you. That's it.